Now, a look at a group that one writer is dubbing a new American aristocracy and the problems it poses for our society. No, it's not the billionaires in the top 0.1 percent of the population, but the group that sits right below them, the 9.9 percent. .9%. Our economics correspondent Paul Salman has more. It's part of our weekly series, Making Sense, which airs Thursdays on the NewsHour. The United States is going down a path. It's a path of class stratification, growing inequality, and the consequences of that are more potentially damaging than I think most people appreciate. In a provocative Atlantic magazine cover story, The Birth of a New Aristocracy, author and philosopher Matthew Stewart argues that growing class division is destabilizing our society. Right, so it turns out that the concentration of wealth in the United States has really been uh, focused on the top 0.1 percent, not the top 1 percent. Um, but that doesn't mean that everybody below them lost money. In fact, only the bottom 90 percent did. So there's this group in between, the 9.9 percent, .9 that have managed to keep pace. They play a very important role in, on the one hand, positively running the economy, on the other hand, basically setting up barriers that prevent people from below to realize the American dream. So how much wealth do the people in the 9.9 percent .9 have? Right now, you need roughly $1.2 million to make it into the 9.9 percent, .9%, and the median is around uh, $2.4 million. Net worth, this is? Yeah, I'm sorry, that, this is all net worth, and, an, is... and it includes all forms of assets, so that would include homes. In the numbers I've seen, it also includes things like cars. It's very important to understand that our wealth is not just financial. We, in the 9.9 percent, .9 we all enjoy better health. We tend to live in better neighborhoods, which means we have less crime to deal with. Uh, we have better education. So all of these non-financial forms of wealth turn out to be critical. They not only make us basically able to generate more economic wealth, but they also consolidate our position. We can then pass them down to our kids. It's obviously not good for people who are stuck below, but your argument is it's not good for people who are lucky enough to be above. Yes, that's right, because as the classes pull apart, the people at, on the upper strata uh, have to work harder to keep their position. They have farther to fall if they make a mistake, so they invest more in preserving their position. But I don't think we've appreciated how that ramifies throughout society, the way it locks them in place, draws battle lines, creates distrust. And what's driving this? The basic driver is something that we've, we're all familiar with. We all know the story of rising inequality that creates a kind of rigidity and instability that also removes fact and reason from our discussions so that we're not able to have a meaningful basis for discussion among all Americans. Inequality feeds on itself to some degree. So the, the greater the concentration of wealth, the more that the people with that wealth can use it to consolidate their position by investing it in non-financial forms of wealth. I've heard this referred to as transactional capital now. It, it can also be just you know, physiological capital in a certain sense. So it turns out that not only are the wealthier getting healthier, but the people in the lower deciles are actually getting less healthy in many respects. So for example, for white middle-aged people with high school education and less, life expectancy has gone down. Part of what's driving this is something that you and others call assortative mating. So assortative mating is just when like marries like. In the past 50 years, we've seen a, a significant increase in this kind of marriage pattern. There are some studies that suggest that as much as a third of the um, growth and concentration of wealth uh, is due to decisions connected with mating, essentially. Just like in the olden days, noble families, kings, queens, they would intermarry to consolidate their power, their wealth. And well, it reminds me of Jane Austen, to be honest, because we are returning to a world in which um, individuals seeking mates are frankly frantic. They can't find true love in someone who is of the adequate social status. Oh, Mr. Bennett, you are wanted immediately. We are all in uproar. You must come and make Lizzie marry Mr. Collins. For she vows she will not have him, and if you do not make haste, Mr. Collins will change his mind and he will not have her. The benefit that you get from matching social status is tremendous, 
And the price you pay for failing to do that, for failing to find a high status mate, has gone up. It's gone up dramatically. If you're low status and you marry a low status mate, marriage is actually harder. It's harder because you're working harder probably or you're, you have greater risks, greater stresses. Uh, you have worse health and consequently you uh, statistically are much less likely to have a stable household. So what do you want the 9.9% .9 to do? We have to start thinking about how we can live in integrated communities that are open to everybody, where geography is not a, an economic and class barrier. Our geography is killing us. I mean, we are setting up a system where we concentrate educational resources, the schools in a particular area, we concentrate yes. economic power. That's why people move to areas like where you live, Brookline, Massachusetts, which has this great educational system, right? Yeah, that's great. We have a quasi-private system of education that we call public. I moved to Brookline, I send my kids to public schools, they're terrific schools, that's why we moved there. And you can too, you just have to buy a home that's worth two million dollars. Now that's a colossal, colossal blunder. In American history, public education was absolutely essential in building the middle class. That's how we got the, the sort of productive economy in which everyone participates and we had a reasonable degree of stability. We're now setting up a system where we, you, you get the education you pay for, and that means you get a bunch of citizens who are uneducated. And that's a recipe for disaster. I think that's what's so difficult for somebody like myself to hear or people in our audience. What we're doing is what comes absolutely naturally to us, if that is investing in our, our kids, moving to a neighborhood with a good school for our children or grandchildren. You don't want me to stop doing that, right? Just because our individual actions are blameless, when we look at them very narrowly, that doesn't mean it's all gonna work out for the best. I lived in Mexico, I lived in the UK for a number of years. I've seen versions of this process going on. Everybody involved is nice, but at the end of the day, they participate in this thing that leads you to a point where you've got a distinct class of wonderful people that a lot of other people are very unhappy with. And the people in that distinct class, at least in places like Mexico, they have actual gunmen in their big fancy houses, right? Right, there, and there's a natural progression from gated communities to armed and gated communities. And we're sort of working through that now. Uh, and if we keep going down this path, yeah, we'll have the armed and gated communities. And none of us will have done anything wrong. But that's where we'll be. For the PBS NewsHour, this is economics correspondent Paul Salmon outside Boston.